Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Australia is creepy once you get into the outback. There's a very distinct feeling that you just don't belong there. Large swaths of the landscape almost emanate an alien malevolence. Anyone who's been there knows what I mean. South Australia, definitely, especially once you're north of the Central Business District. There's a reason it's the murder capital of the country, and all those murders happen north of the Central Business District. South of it is just a small chunk of Melbourne. My dad's friend Ken always tells this story when we're out camping. Ken is this giant Aboriginal dude, about six foot five, and would weigh 120 kilograms or so. One of those really hardened dudes covered in scars. Anyways, Ken and all his mates, who are also tough as nails, were out camping in West New South Wales, just chilling by the fire. Suddenly, all of the cicadas in the area decide to shut up all at once. As the silence becomes prolonged, a giant, coming from Ken, it must have been massive. Harry Dude walks calmly up to the fire and just looks at all of them, calmly sniffs and grunts towards all the guys camping, who are now frozen still, and then casually bumbles back into the surrounding bush. All the guys freak out and bail. The story is fairly tame, but those guys are all crazy, and for them to admit being spooked off instead of just beating the shit out of the creature adds another level of weirdness to the tale. When retelling the story, Ken always looks legitimately spooked out. When I was a kid, I went out into the bush northeast of Kalgoorlie with a family friend who worked out there looking for places where there might be mineral reserves. It was getting late in the afternoon when he showed us a shaft he'd found that he had no explanation for. It was about three by three meters and lined with concrete and a single ladder going down into darkness. On top, it had a heavy metal door with a wheel to open it. We didn't go down it though, because going into unknown shafts is asking for trouble, like suffocating to death. Pick related, it was in an area like this slightly off of a track. Be four-wheel drive driving at night with my brother-in-law and one of his mates, all in one car, all drunk and brother-in-law is pretty silly. Floors it into a deep rut. So Stuck can't even dig it out or get friction from stuffing logs under tires. Brother-in-law jokes about winding up the windows because of the yao we around these parts, nervously laugh it off. A few minutes later, loud thumping, twigs cracking, and a sound that's sort of like a mix between a bull looking for a mate and a hay like nothing I've ever heard after years of camping and exploring the bush. Civilization is at least two hours away, so it's no pranksters, all sitting there in the pitch black, nopeying. The rustle of leaves and snapping twigs gets closer. Turn on spotters and high beams and look toward the source of noise. On the edge of darkness, see huge shadowy figure turn and bolt. Couldn't make any features out, except that it was big. All of a sudden, all noise ceases completely. Decide to not spend the night and call a mate to tow us out ASAP. We eventually grew some balls and stumbled out to light a fire to distract us, help keep us awake. No other events happened though, as is usually the case. Still one of the most horrifying experiences of my life, even though it could probably be easily explained. Map related. I grew up on Norfolk Island. There were tourist traps and ghost stories for the most part. But the scariest thing was these tunnels we found all over the island that were from the convict settlement days. The ones we already knew about were under the main jail at Kingston on the south side of the island. They were the most accessible and were used as solitary confinement. The walls at the south end of the tunnel looked newer and made out of different stone. And a local told us that they used to lock people in the tunnels and then when the tide came in, the water would flood the tunnels and they'd drown. Not sure if he was BSing, though. The other ones we found were dotted around the north side of the island and on Mount Pitt and Mount Bates. They were properly made with the same sandstone and limestone that the jail at Kingston and older buildings at other places were. But the placement was so nonsensical. We found four and only one of them had a building nearby, just an old chimney stack left after the wooden house had rotted away. The one near the chimney was the shortest and went in one side of a hillock and out the other. They were all maybe four feet high, so you have to stoop down to get through them. Occasionally, you have to crawl or slide on your stomach in the longer ones. If I had to compare them to anything, 
it would be the tunnels that the Viet Cong used in Vietnam around Dien Bien Phu, except that Norfolk has never seen a battle. Anyway, how we found the main ones was when we were all 15 and 16. I was doing work placement as a physio in the hospital, and an old local came in with these photos of orange crabs. He was a regular at the physio, so he came in to get his joints de-oldified and waffle on about old people stuff. But the day he brought the photos in, he started talking about how when he was my age, he and his friends were climbing the mountain and came across a freshwater spring with all these crabs around the place. This picture is of the jail. I tried to find one with the tunnels. If you imagine you're taking this photo, the entrance to the jail tunnels are about 10 meters to your right. The last time I was there, they were unmarked, but there was talk of building a fence around the entrance. The freshwater spring claim sounds like bull now because the freshwater table on the island is so dependent on the cyclone season's rainfall that having constant water on the mountain seems unlikely. The only near constant stream of fresh water on the island is at Kingston, which is below sea level in some places, and up near Headstone in the lower parts. Everywhere else needs bores drilled, and the island has no sense of water management, so now, if you look at the wiki, it will say less than 0.01% next to the available fresh water stat. Yeah. He said that the crabs were on Mount Bates, which at the time only had a dirt road going pretty much straight up. You either walked up or took a dirt bike, and going off-road meant thick rainforest. Mount Pitt had a constantly collapsing asphalt road that claimed about three workers a decade. So I talked my friends into going on this stand-by-me pilgrimage up Mount Bates to find the crabs. We packed supplies, chips, coke, chocolate, left early, 11 o'clock and set out according to plan. Literally walk up the mountain. Should mention here that there are no myths of creatures roaming the forest or anything. Apart from the ubiquitous black dog stories, it was pretty much exclusively ghosts and aliens. The mountain isn't that tall, but the forest is dense as hell. We had our dad's machetes, but aside from huge pines and sprawling banyans, the undergrowth is pretty much covered in guava, which is so tough to the point of being a waste of time to cut through and bastard wood, which is the really thick, vine-like roots of the banyan trees. It was tough going. Pick is the old mill. Really weird and cool because it's quite away from the water, but underground so you can hear the waves crashing as if they were right there. So the cool thing about the forests of Norfolk is that occasionally you come across old failed attempts at civilization. The stone foundations of a house or corrugated iron, or a stretch of barbed wire fence that is still standing. The historical society and environmental folk have most of these marked with orange metal tags, but occasionally they are unmarked, and you wonder if you're the first person to step foot there in ages. At the base of the mountain, but surprisingly far in, there are rat and feral cat traps, which means the environmental organization. I forget the name now, it's something like Norfolk Island EPA or similar. Make regular trips into that location. We'd been in for a few hours when we found a really old steam boiler which had rusted to hell. It was obviously not from the convict era which raised questions as to why it was there. We had lunch there and nearby is where we found a pretty short but very windy tunnel. It was really easy to explore and we were pretty fearless because there were five of us and we all went in at once. Inside were some rocks and broken glass jars. We weren't the first people there since the convict era, but it wasn't like they were beer or coke bottles or anything useful to date the tunnel with. No lids either. Years later we theorized that with the boiler and jars there was some kind of moonshine or drug operation going on, but Norfolk doesn't have that kind of market for drugs. 2,500 people and maybe 500 of them around the age that drugs are cool. There are only two cops, so keeping it. That secret seems stupid. We left the tunnel and boiler and kept heading up the mountain. Pick is what popped up when I googled old steam boiler, and that is more or less identical to the one in the forest. We were nearing the summit, which was disheartening because if there was going to be a freshwater spring, it would be further away from the top. The most likely place we found later was in the saddle of Mount Pitt and Mount Bates, but it was dry. Anyway, we'd been going for four or five hours, the sun had gone over the other side of the mountain, and once we got to the top, it was a relatively easy walk down the dirt road. We found the longest tunnel when we were playing around throwing rocks. 
My friend threw one back down the slope a bit and we heard a really loud echo. A lot like this, but not as long. What the hell was that? I don't know. We climbed down to find out and discovered that we had almost literally walked right over the entrance. Looking from down the slope upwards, it would have been obscured by a thatch of guava. But coming down, you could see the sandstone sticking out really well. None of the tunnels looked exactly inviting, but this one especially seemed darker somehow, more cramped. We shone our torches in there and saw that after about 10 meters, it took a right turn. Of course, we went right in. Not only was this one the longest, it was one of two tunnels we found that had a branching path. The other was the jail tunnel, which spooked no one since it was so frequently explored. The other thing unique to the gold tunnel in this one was the little shafts that went up to the surface. A lot of them were clogged with dirt and plants, but some still let sunlight in. When we came across the fork in the path, we decided to explore the left tunnel first. We were already deeper than we'd been in anywhere before and admittedly were getting spooked out. I'm claustrophobic as hell, but... I was with people, so I was being pretty intrepid about everything. But then the tunnel narrowed for about three meters, which made us have to go single file. I can't think of a reason that they'd make it go like that. Here is an ACI version of how it went. We heard another echo when me and two others were through, but all we said was, shut up, be careful, and you scared the shit out of me. Basically, we all blamed one another for kicking a rock or something and thought nothing of it. Right after that section were two more things unique to this tunnel, a downward slope and curves. Even the windiest tunnel was all right angles. It went down no more than a few feet and curved almost back in on itself. At the bottom was the end of the tunnel, which opened into a room about five by five feet, and the ceiling was almost high enough to stand in. Our fear went away. It was actually kind of cool in there. The floor was pretty bare, apart from a distinct pile of stones in the far corner. We stayed there for a few minutes and I could have sworn we missed nothing, but we did. We came back out to the fork and argued for a bit as to explore the right-hand side or just leave. I was in two minds. If we left now, we might not find it again, but I was also getting creeped out just by being in a cramped space. I should also mention that there were no bugs or spiders in the tunnels, even though there are horrific colonies of golden orbs on the island that will cover your house in webs if you let them. We decided to man up and explore the right-hand tunnel. Our arguing turned out to be not worth much since the tunnel ended after a left turn and came to a small chamber. I didn't think much of anything until my friend screamed. We all freaked out for a second until he calmed himself enough to say, Skeleton. I looked down and sure enough it was a goddamn skeleton. We all screamed and freaked out and scrabbled for the tunnel but then one of us started laughing. You idiots, it's cow bones which is all well and good and relieving until we all realize that. 1. The tunnels are too small for a cow to get into. 2. Even though cows roam the island outside of paddocks, one wouldn't be in the forest and the dirt road had a cattle grid. 3. There's no animal big enough on the island to drag a cow into the tunnel, right? 4. There are three pelvis bones in here. This didn't spook us out until we talked about it later. At the time, it just seemed kind of weird. We stayed in the chamber for a bit and my friend found another little sunlight shaft, except this one pointed down. He shone his torch down and said, Oh, cool. I went over and looked down the shaft. I was pretty sure I was looking down into the room that the left tunnel went into. The light barely reached the far corner, but I was definitely looking at the pile of stones that was in the room. We all took turns to look down there until one of us said, I don't see anything, it's blocked. I called him an asshole and grabbed his torch and looked down the shaft. He was right. Something had blocked the shaft in the time between me and the next guys looking down there. I WTF'd and gave the torch back. He looked back down. I've never seen someone move so fast in my life. He dropped the torch down the shaft, didn't make a noise and crawled over the cow bones to the far side of the chamber. We couldn't calm him down or stop him hyperventilating and we sort of went into action mode and decided to get him out of there as quickly as we could. I took a glance down the shaft again and the torch was lighting up most of the chamber. You had a full view of the room we were in before from the one we were in then. Whatever was blocking it was gone. We got out of the tunnel. A panicky friend pretty much sprinted out as soon as he saw sunlight and milled around the entrance. 
We asked him what he saw, and he said that the thing blocking the tunnel was someone's face, and he hadn't realized until it blinked. We all gave him shit and brought up the Barney Duffy myth, which is some bullshit about a convict-era wild man living in a woods. But we were still creeped out. After all, something had definitely blocked the shaft. By the time we got to the top of the mountain, it was getting dark, and night had fully set in by the time we had reached the bottom by walking back along the road. We didn't really say anything apart from the odd joke about seeing Barney Duffy. We went into the first house we could find to use the phone. It's that kind of place and got our friend's dad to pick us up. Years later we still joke about it and we heard the occasional story about people spotting things in the forest and houses near the edge being raided, knives and food stolen and whatnot. But it's one of the least talked about legends on the island. For one, the population has grown since then and the mountains have proper-ish roads. And people tend to favor simpler ghost stories that bring spoopy seeking tourists in. I told some of the older locals about it and they pretty much go, yeah, there's been weird things on the mountain since I was a boy, and trail off into another ghost story. Can't be bothered green texting because I'm on my iPad. I went camping once when I was 14. I went off for a piss and came back to the fire. Everyone was going to bed, so I decided to put out the fire. Just as I threw a bucket of dirt on the fire, I see this flash of a bloke in front of me. I get too spooked out and went to bed. On the train trip home after the hike, this swaggy, legit, looked like out of waltzing Matilda, sat next to me for an hour and just talked to me about stuff and I listened. I remember he looked at me and said, you need to be careful, son. Then I woke up covered in sweat next to my mate on the train. It was so real. Two weeks later, I was walking around with my mate late at night, just talking about anything, and my mate went off to the public toilet. I turn around and there's this same guy from the train about 60 meters away. He gets up and basically disappears into the night. Three years later, I'm at the train station to go to Sydney, and as I'm going to the train, this swaggy grabs me and says to my face, hey mate, everything's fixed now, and smiles and just disappears into the crowd. Honestly, man, it was spooky, but he gave me this sense of calmness over me. I don't know what he did over those three years, but damn, I'm glad he did it. He seemed like a genuinely nice spirit bloke. Don't have green text to continue, bit. Do have something odd from growing up. Be me 15-year-old visiting grandparents' cattle farm in far north New South Wales, Australia. Old enough to be trusted with the ute and with a 22 lr teenager so scared of nothing. Death happens to old people mixed property, largely what you'd describe as grassland, with a large section of forester areas, would take three or four hours to go from the north border of eucalyptus forest to the southern side. Decided to leave the ute, take the rifle and go and try my luck with rabbits and feral dogs in the forest. Middle of the day, so most rabbits and feral dogs find shade to escape the heat. Come across a beautiful natural waterfall, where a river in the property falls down three tiers of rock falls, Breathtakingly beautiful. Drought as usual, so water is not a torrent, but enough to have to brace yourself against the force of the flow. Stand on the second tier of falls and survey all that is my domain. Suddenly I have a terribly morose feeling, like the urge to cry my eyes out, the deepest sense of sadness I've ever experienced. Think it's weird, but I think nothing of it. Head down river track and shoot a few rabbits and a few feral dogs, help call their numbers before the calves come. Avoid waterfall on the way back. Clamber up the rock face instead with a rifle and dead bag. Mention it to Pop at tea time. Looks like he's just been punched in the mouth. Understanding not found. Pop gets some full blood aboriginals to come into the property, find the waterfall and do whatever they do. Was a teenage kid so wasn't involved in adult negotiations etc. Made to swear I'd never visit the waterfall again. That's about it. Not particularly scary. Just weird when I look back on it now as an adult. Did some research of the property after Pop was out into a nursing home with dementia. He inherited the property from his father. These were hard bastards of men. Pop had scars across his back of whip marks from beatings he got when he was a kid from his old man. Found a few references of aboriginals being hunted like animals and killed en masse in the vague area. But this was at least a century before the property ever came into our family's hands. It's pretty much in the middle of nowhere and I have always wondered if that had anything to do with the strangeness of the place. Like their spirits were still angry or hadn't ever been able to go to the never-never or whatever. 
asked Pop once when I was in my 20s, but he claimed he had no recollection of the event. Knew the old bugger remembered. He got that punched-in-the-mouth look about him again. Whatever it was scared him enough to get full bloods in. No point asking him now. Poor bastard's brain has turned to mush. Be about 12 or 13. Young woman from Sydney had left home, and from what I've been able to find in old papers was heading for Nimbin. It's assumed she met up with some like-minded dross, and they decided to go explore the forests. Between the casino and Nimbin is a little place called Kyogle, lots of scrub protected national park. We were in year seven at high school, and when a few of them went missing in the scrub, all the schools had police come in and give us talks about how dangerous the scrub could be if you didn't know what you were doing. Most of us had family on the land around the area and laughed it off. We knew the verges of the scrub around there like the backs of our hands. We'd sneak in there and drink and a few of the older kids would pass around doobies. Good Catholic boy here, never went in for that. But the booze, I was as guilty as the others. Massive search and rescue operation. Cops, state emergency service, choppers, the lot. Being kids, we had no idea what all the fuss was about. But for a good six months after that, the Aboriginal kids were sworn on pain of thrashing by their parents that the bush around Kyogle was out of bounds. No negotiation. Being European kids, we were just told these city wankers had headed into the bush, got stoned on LSD, heroin or whatever they were into, and either died of exposure or overdose. The Aboriginal kids thought we're terrified of the place for months. There are some parts of their culture that they would share with us, and some they knew was only for them. Understandable had a mate, Mick, who risked having been beaten by his family for telling us that their elders had forbidden going into the bush because the shadow men, whatever that meant to them, were traveling through the forest. Deer and Bondi, Queensland. Used to head out there to do some pig shooting about 10 years ago, and two nights stick in my mind like they are tattooed into my brain. The first night we went out in the ute and just after dark, we drove straight into an unsighted bog hole. We decided to stay the night, and dig it out in the morning. The night was rather uneventful, or so we thought. We woke to find the biggest paw prints we have ever seen all around, and over the ute. The prints were on the bonnet, windscreen, and the tray, on the windows, as if it had jumped up onto the door to look through the glass, and all around the ute in the mud. These prints were far too big to be a normal dog, but they looked more like cat prints. I don't know how long this thing was eyeing us off, but I am glad we had the windows up only leaving a small gap for air. We did follow the tracks the next morning, but we lost it after walking for an hour. Same place, another night. Ute broke down which left us with about a three-hour walk back to the cattle station. About halfway back, my dad says, how long have they had a train line out here? They don't, I say. Well, what is that then? A light about the size of a basketball was traveling through the paddock, about 10 feet or so off the ground, no sudden movements, no change of direction, just a constant rate of speed and direction. When the light got close enough, you could see that there was nothing behind it, just a floating light. Asking the local bushies the next morning about the light, we learnt about the Min Min lights. This happened in an area that some of you will know really well. Or Mo. Now keep in mind there was a lion park just up the road back in these days. When the fire trail was first put in, my neighbor's dad had the job of bulldozing the trees. This fella is a pretty tough bloke, one who couldn't scare easily. Anyway, one night he never returned home. 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m., by 9 p.m., a small search party, family and friends, went out looking for him. When we found the bulldozer, ignition on but out of fuel, he was sitting inside the cab shaking intensely and muttering, Big cat, big cat. There were some huge tracks around the dozer which led into the bush. He refused to ever go back in there. When a few of us went back in the next day to get his dozer out, he made us take at least one firearm. You are not going in there without a gun, he kept saying. So next time you guys are in there, and head out into the bush. Our house was on a forest property in rural New South Wales, Australia with only two neighbors. It was New Year's night and the neighbors were having a New Year's party coming into 2003. My brother, 13, and I, 10, had been at the party with other kids having fun as our parents were there. It got boring after a few hours, so brother and I head home to play Final Fantasy X on PS2. This night, unlike others, given the party atmosphere, 
All the windows and blinds were open to the forest at the rear of the property and the main road and forest beyond. We were both being jovial, laughing and talking when we both got a sense of dread, pure dread, where your adrenaline kicks in, your hair stands on end and body shakes. We both turned instinctively. We both knew something was watching us from the kitchen window. We couldn't see it, but it was there in the dark. Luckily, our house layout allowed us to exit to the rear veranda to the backyard via the laundry door. The kitchen also had a door to the veranda. Whatever it was watched us through wood slats, moved around to a large bush at the corner of the house and continued to watch. My brother had grabbed a broom and smacked it against a tree to scare the thing. The broomstick snapped into a sharp stake. This thing bailed back around the house towards the forest. We hauled ass to the fence line, climbed an old caravan, and bounced over. I landed in dog feces. The party proceeded as usual. The countdown happened within minutes. Note, we never actually saw it. It was hidden in the shadows and bush. Where it was standing was on stone gravel. I spent 13 years playing on that. It wasn't a man nor a known animal. Deduction. Thing must have been at least one and a half meters tall to see us through the kitchen window. Its feet must have been small, or pointed like the tip of crab leg from the sound it made leaving. My brother is of the same opinion and still talks about it to this day. I work for a power company, and when I was a first-year apprentice, Part of the work was doing inspections on remote transformer units, supplying power to farmers and rural properties. You'd have to be really careful about getting access to people's land, because there's some real hermits out there. Myself and the tradie I was with had been held at gunpoint once by some old guy while we were doing an inspection on this guy's transformer. I can only assume he was growing slash making drugs out there because we were told to get in our car, leave and say we'd never been there. Another time we were out towards the east in Kalgoorlie and the surrounds and went through the ghost town of Kanona. There really is an eerie vibe about those abandoned settlements in the middle of the desert, and it's not hard to use a bit of imagination and see yourself getting kidnapped and murdered. Australia really is a beautiful country, but it has a lot of desolate wastelands which really make you thankful for having a well-maintained car and a good supply of food and water. I'm guessing you don't hear much from Aussie in regards to nope threads because our animals and insects are probably the biggest nopes to most of you on here. But I got one. Be in Australia, New South Wales. Go ghost hunting at various hotspots. Team of four in a car. Two search, two remain in the car. Tactics.jpg. Search area and nothing good. But felt an eerie cold chill. It wasn't external, it was as it was inside my clothing and body. Difficult to explain further. Go back to the car with a team member. Explain we nothing happened but neglected to mention the cold snap I felt. Weird because it's the middle of summer. In the car, passenger says energy can cling to you long after you leave an area like that. Immediately shudder and grit my teeth because something feels horribly wrong. We stopped at a bar a few suburbs over. Go to urinals because a man's gotta go. That relieving feeling is suddenly cut short. I saw in my peripherals a black mass or something. It had no particular shape. Stood as tall as me, maybe a little taller. It was about 30 centimeters away, around one foot, and I could hear faint breathing that wasn't my own. Black isn't the right way to describe it. It seems void of color. As soon as I acknowledged it, that deep dread feeling came back stronger than anything I have ever felt in my life. I've now stopped pissing, zipped up, and I literally cannot bring myself to move. In my head, I'm begging someone, anyone, to walk into the men's room, hoping somehow it might ward off whatever this is. I know it's looking at me. Now this part I remember clearly as crystal. I had this insatiable urge not to look at it directly. But primal instincts are going wild wanting to register visually what I'm freaking out over. Get an idea to turn counterclockwise and walk behind it. As I'm washing my hands I'm nearly crying as I can only feel what could be described as helplessness and desperation. Something is grabbing both sides of my ribs. Not just scratching but it feels as if my ribs are cracking under immense pressure. I can't speak for two reasons now. Paralyzing fear, Ghost Hulk is giving me a squeeze. I quickly leave while avoiding anything reflective so as to not look at this thing and engage it. Head down, walk straight to mates waiting at a bar table for me. I don't look at them straight away, try to control myself and force a faux smile and thank them for waiting. Anon, are you okay? You look seriously bad. Let out a week. What? Oh, I'm just having trouble breathing. Anon, you're pale and your lips are blue. 
panic a little and lift my shirt up to check my chest cavity, hand marks and start wheezing with panic upon sight. Beg them to get me the hell out of this area and take me home. They do. Never went back and didn't sleep at all that night. TLDR, Ghost watched me pee and tried to cuddle me hard. Out for the evening with my wife and son, sitting in my chair enjoying the outback, sipping on my beer, hear something moving nearby. It's the waitress. She's brought me my steak. It is undercooked as hell. I asked for medium. They brought me rare at best. Never going back to that shitty ass steakhouse ever again. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.